or adjudicators dispute, you know, in a manner which you feel that. You have to resort to, you know, see, to sound law. You have to take, you know, see, shelter under some asana. You can't simply say that I feel this is logical or I feel this is appropriate and therefore it is my decision. It doesn't work. It doesn't work in democracy. Yeah, with that we come to the law of joint ownership. One of the important factors is in a joint ownership is that when two or more persons derive a title over a property, the, the important question which remains to be addressed is that is he a owner? The answer is yes, he is owner. So what is his right of ownership? Can you quantify his right of ownership? And that is where you know the importance comes. The law provides you with a right. It becomes and tells you that yes, that you know, it, unless otherwise provided, the owners are equal owners. Unless otherwise provided, the owners are equal owners. In the same, and this happens in many cases. That's why you should be careful that when you're purchasing a property together with your wife, whose name is there in order to just support. You know, because somebody advised you to put her in, or you know, say you just wanted to please her without really being her, without really being that to be so and in that case you should be careful. So a joint ownership is the law in the same way provides that yes, that in a case where the transaction is funded by two persons or more persons, then depending upon the funds which are provided, in that proportion you will determine the owner. If it is not so provided, this is a second guiding line where then you will determine what is her ownership, her share of ownership. So if it is stated it is good, then that what is stated will rule the rest. If it is not stated, you will be decide on the basis of the funds. You will decide on the basis of the funds. So this is simultaneously, when nothing is stated, as I say that it is considered to be equal ownership. In a kind where it is considered to be a co-ownership property. So law once again has two very different concepts here. One is joint tenancy, another one is tenancy in common. And none of these two concepts have anything to do with tenancy as we understand in the system. These are cases of ownership only. One is joint tenancy, another one is tenancy in common. So what is the distinction that's understood? Joint tenancy is something where under the persons who are owning the property in a joint fashion are the equal owners without having definite rights in it. They are owners, they are they are owners over 100 percent of the property. The other person also is 100 percent So to, to exemplify this is that if a property is consisting of say 100 square feet of property, 100 square feet of area. Over each square feet or each square inch, both of them have the equal share. It would not be that, okay, you know, that the southern part is belonging to an X person and the northern part is belonging to the one person. And why, why are we discussing is that in order to appreciate that if somebody comes to sell you the northern part by saying that, look here, I am 50 percent owner, I am entitled to sell you the northern part, that is not turning the law, you will have to take a consent by making the other person also a wedding party to this property. This is the concept of joint ownership. Related to joint ownership is another beautiful principle of this. That in case of a joint owner, you cannot pass it on to your legal lives by succession. You do not have a right of making a will in respect of that property. You are owning jointly the other owner. So therefore, unless otherwise provided for, which is so provided in the Hindu Succession Act and Indian Succession Act in respect of the family properties. But unless otherwise provided, the property passes to the other surviving joint owner by the law of survivorship, not by succession. So therefore, if you are owning a property jointly with somebody, then in that case, on passing away of yourself or on your demise, it will go 100% to the remaining survivor. It's not that your 50% will go to another, your leaders. It's not that. As it is that tenancy in common is a contrary concept. Where if you have a definite share in the property, you own the southern part of the area, you own certain percentage of area, then in that case you are a co-owner or a tenancy in common. Say 
you see, Koda Cement is the famous case. We have agreed not to refer to the case and so on. Also, I want to hear is the case where you know that what is important is the user because depreciation is user related. Though it is related to ownership of a property also, but it is primarily user related. The dominant relevant factor is that you should be using the property because depreciation is the concept of use. If you don't use it, it cannot depreciate otherwise. Parent time will be reference to time is a reference to it, but otherwise it is primarily user related. So therefore the courts have inclined themselves to courts have inclined themselves to read it a little differently so as to use the term beneficial ownership. Even though you are under an agreement which is not a deed of conveyance, which is you are not registered, but you are seen to be using it, you are you have been seen to have made payment for it, the other side is not claiming the ownership over the property, then in such case you will be the person who is entitled to the decision. And if we understand and accept this principle in law in income tax act, section 41, section 43 all will follow suit. For the purposes of 41 and 43 also, the ownership which is referred to in those sections would be the one that would be the beneficial ownership. So therefore this is little contrary to the ownership which is contained, which is understood in the context of section 20. As far as the salary person is concerned, the reference is made at two different places. One is for the purposes of 1030. 1030A provides that you will not be entitled to claim exemption if you are found to be in receipt of house rent allowance and if you happen to be owner of another house. So the ownership here once again is not a necessarily a beneficial ownership. This here in my limited opinion would be the one which is to be gathered from understanding the provisions of transfer of property. Even though I am in possession of a property but if I am not a fair owner of that property, I do not have a good title or a dominion over the property, 1030 day perhaps should not apply in my case. For the purposes of valuation of purchasing, you know the valuation rules would apply, section 17 would apply to your case provided you are found to be the owner of the residential accommodation and this one the ownership once again here would be the one because the company is required to be the owner. That will have to be established before these provisions of the opposite rules and rule 3 is applied to your case. Capital gains and ownership is worth it. Keep on talking about it. But two or three issues you know which arise out of it and just highlighting it and in the end you know I'll take it up again for discussion. That one is the concept of a previous owner. Now previous owner is different than the ownership. He has not only to be the owner, but he also has to be the previous owner. He has not only to be the owner, the requirement of being an owner is ingrained. In addition, you have to be the previous owner. That has been defined by the explanation. The explanation says is the one, previous owner is the one who is the last owner of the property. The one previous to the one who is existing. The one previous to the one who is existing. And it's not an end of the road. It further carries it to say that he is the one who had acquired it in a mode other than the specified modes. But look, he is the person who should not have acquired through a gift or succession or any such other thing. He must be the one who has actually purchased the property. So the pedigree would go back to the previous owner who has acquired it by way of payment of a consideration. This is loosely explaining the thing is, but broadly it means that only that a person who has acquired it in a mode other than the specified modes in the last pedigree is the one who is the previous owner. Why it is relevant is it is his cost of acquisition which will become your cost of acquisition. His cost of acquisition will become your cost of acquisition. His period of holding will become your period of holding. His right to tax will begin with the year in which he had acquired and similarly you will also do this. So this concept of previous ownership is a good interesting concept whenever you have tried to understand that. The other part where the ownership is referred to and, and, and it is here that where it causes serious misunderstandings between the revenue department and the taxpayers of this. This reference at two different places in 
looking for that. Where at the, you know, the person who is owning yet another house is disentitled from claiming the benefit of Section 54 Act. So what is this ownership which one is talking about? Is owning yet another house. If I am owning it as a joint owner, am I disentitled? If I am owning it as a owner, am I disentitled? If I am owning it as a lessee, I am disentitled. These are the issues which repeatedly arise in the context of Section 54 Act and even in the end we will try to touch upon that. In the context of 45.2, it is the owner to whom the provisions are made applicable. It is the owner to whom the provisions are made applicable. An owner who is converting his capital asset to a stock in trade is attracting 45.2. If you are not an owner, 45.2 will not apply to you. So therefore, this again is something you know, which would at a time would become a matter of litigation. As far as 50B is concerned, this is a unique placement in 50B, where under, in, the, in the context of a slum sale, an industrial undertaking is sought to be transferred, 50B is activated in the office. It is to override all cases where you know, it has been held that capital gains will not be taxed because it cannot be ascertained.